right, we are live on the YouTube. I'm still Dave Rubin, and we've got another Friday roundtable extravaganza for you. Today we're talking about how COVID has impacted our children, our relationships, and possibly most importantly, our mental health. Joining me to discuss our author of the upcoming book, Dear Hartley, Thoughts on Character, Kindness, and Building a Brighter World, Jedediah Bila, I've got the book right here, host of the Washington Examiner Newsmaker series, Alicia Krauss, and author of The End of Gender, Debunking the Myths About Sex and Identity in Our Society, Dr. Deborah So. Ladies, welcome to the Rubin Report. Hi, Hi Dave. So I have never had an all-female panel before. I'm, I'm slightly freaking out. Are you guys gonna take it easy <laughs> on me today? Yeah, no. no. Absolutely no, we'll not. I don't know if you're prepared <laughs> for this, Dave. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to come out right out of the gate and say, I don't know if you're ready. I am definitely not prepared. I feel like <laughs> I feel like Megan McCain on The View, which Jedediah, you know a little something <laughs> about. Um, all right, so let's bit. let's jump in because there, there's a whole bunch of stuff I want to talk to you guys about. And I thought at the end of this week, it was so nutty as always. I didn't want to do just like pure like recap political nonsense. I want to talk about the human part of some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So Alicia, I want to start with you. Uh, just talk about the COVID situation, masks and vaccines related to kids. You have, you have young kids, you take them out and about here in crazy Los Angeles. Uh, how old are your kids again? And, and how's it going just having kids in the mix, in, in the midst of this whole thing? I actually have to say having kids in the mix of this is, seems more difficult now in this like post half lockdown mandate type thing than it was even in early COVID. We're blessed to have a yard and a pool. We've been social since April of 2020, hosting playdates and going places and doing things. And it seemed easier back then. Now it's much more difficult. Uh, I do take my girls all over Los Angeles. And we, I do not mask them unless we're getting on an airplane and absolutely have to. Uh, I've, my two-year-old has never been asked to be masked on a plane, which is I'm kind of glad I haven't had an incident with a Karen flight attendant yet. Yet, uh, and it's patience, hard. Patience. I think you know, <laughs> my kids are very social. Uh, I'm homeschooling. I tell people I'm a massive fan of school choice, as you know. But I wanted. I wanted to be able to choose whether or not to homeschool. And I felt like this year I was kind of forced to homeschool because I wasn't going to send my second grader to school to be in a mask all day in an environment where she would be totally fine. And if she did get COVID, it'd be completely traceable. Unlike, you know, the Rolling Stones at SoFi Stadium the other night where masks mm -hmm. were not enforced and people were just like flashing their phones to get in, pretending like they had a vaccine card. And Lord knows, I mean, I love how the media is such a double standard of churches John MacArthur, super yep. spreader, Rolling Stones, totes okay. Yeah, I, it's hard. It's, it's really hard on kids. And I'm grateful that they have us. Uh, but there are lots of kids, even with two incredible parents that are experiencing anxiety, emotional, educational, communicative delays. And, and my kids are some of those. Jedediah Hartley's on the cover of the book. So how's he doing in the midst of all of this? And actually, I'm not even totally sure. Where, where are you? That, that'll give a little context to Yeah, some so of this. I went, I'm in New York City of all places, leaving though, leaving because I cannot justify <laughs> raising a leave. child in this dis bad dystopian novel that's unfolding here. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's been pretty hard for him. I mean, Hartley is almost two years old. He was about four and a half months old when COVID really hit its stride in New York City. Uh, he actually had COVID. Um, his only symptom was eczema. He was fine. He laughed through the whole thing. Was It was a big inspiration to everyone in the house at the time. But um, it was really challenging because kids learn from other kids. And, you know, I had the experience of having taught kids for a really long time. I taught, you know, ages two straight through college. So I know that children need to be around other children. I know that these masks are incredibly detrimental because their development, their behavioral skills, they learn so much by reading emotions on people's faces. And for a very long time, I couldn't get him to have any contact with children. We don't have a lot of family here. We don't have a lot of little kids in our family. So I was looking forward to mommy and me this or daddy and me that, and just having his development go like any other kid. And it was impossible, even upon leaving Manhattan, it was still impossible. Places were closed and then, you know, if you did get to go to a place, even though the kids weren't masked because he was too small for that, luckily, the adults were masked. And that bothered me a lot, too, because mm -hmm. he was scared of people. He developed fears about people. He, you know, you take him to a pediatrician's office and the pediatrician is masked. I don't want that 
to be what he holds on to. So it was incredibly challenging. Um, and, you know, it has let up a little bit recently. Um, but, but, you know, just watching him go through that, there were some things that he was a little bit late to the party on in terms of learning because mm -hmm. he couldn't see other kids. And once I could get him with those kids, it made such, it was like instantaneous pickup. Yeah. And I was like, wow, this child has really been missing out. Um, so watching what's unfolded truly on these airplanes with these masked children, I mean, this child abuse is actively happening in many of these facilities uh, for a disease that 99.99% plus of children survive. So at some point as a society, it is incumbent upon us to say enough and not just say enough, but fight back. Yeah, and I've said it a million times just to reiterate your point, but the latest CDC numbers that we could pull off their own website, the morbidity for children under 18 years old, 0.002%, about 500 yep. kids. And also there's a lot of evidence that some of that had all sorts of other comorbidities and some of them shouldn't have counted and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, Deborah, to, to both of the ladies' point, just psychologically, what we are doing to a entire generation of children, four-year-olds that we're keeping in masks, they're not reading facial cues, they're not seeing their friends, they're spending more time on TikTok, on iPads and everything else. What do you think this is going to do to this mass group of young people that are, I agree with Jedediah, that are being abused, basically? I mean, I'm I'm really concerned about this. I want to say I don't do clinical work anymore, and so I don't work with kids. But I would say, I mean, you don't need to look at the research literature to know that this, I mean, it's such a critical time in their lives in terms of something as simple as interacting with their friends. These mandates like masks, mask, the mask mandates, and also social distancing. I understand that it's coming from a place in some cases of people being concerned about these children and wanting to protect them. But like you said, the risk of children contracting COVID is so low. And I, I really feel in some ways it's just parental anxieties that are being justified or being um, encouraged instead of pushed back on, which it's not ultimately going to be good for these kids. So in terms of, say, something like socio-emotional development, learning emotions, reading emotions, and um, also being able to adequately communicate how someone is, a child is feeling. Mm -hmm. um, for children especially who, say, have a predisposition towards being on the autism spectrum. So I, I don't think these mandates will cause a child to have autism, but I, I do worry what the implications will be because for a child who is on the autism spectrum, they have difficulties expressing themselves, difficulties with social reciprocity, so difficulties also in terms of reading other people's perspectives, um, explaining their own feelings and emotions. And so I, I, I don't think this is going to be good for their development either. Yeah. Steve, can I just just yeah. add one thing? Is because we often talk about small children, but mm -hmm. also let's not forget those adolescents that missed yep. graduations, that missed, you know, their sweet 16s, that missed these monumental events in their lives that also shape them. I mean, they're learning how to interact with members of the opposite sex. They're they're learning a lot about themselves mm -hmm. through self-discovery through that time in their lives. And now yep. they're being deprived of that. So, you know, and they're also absorbing all of the anxiety in their households. You know, when you're a 16 year old and you're hearing conversations constantly about how mommy or daddy's gonna lose their job because mm -hmm. there's now a vaccine mandate that they have a medical exemption to and suddenly that's, you know, the, the company saying it doesn't count and now finances are tight. I mean, they have absorbed the weight of things that are far greater than what's been just inflicted upon them in terms of masks or missing school, although those things are grave. It goes way deeper than that. And what types of skills have these kids now not developed properly because we prevented them from being in regular, normal settings? Yeah, I, I get thousand that. percent. To that point, I mean, are you shocked at how few parents actually push back on this stuff? I mean, even this morning now, CDC is trying to push that there will be vaccine mandates for kids as young as five years old, and you know then they'll push it beyond that. And it's like, this stuff could not have possibly been tested properly. We know that the pharmaceutical companies aren't even liable legally if something goes wrong. Also, kids just don't need it. If you look at the statistics, there is no reason to give my four-year-old next year when she turns five a COVID vaccine for something that she's likely already had. 
and something that she has a great survivability for because thank God she has no underlying symptoms. I just think it's ridiculous. Kids, there's been an increase in RSV, which is much more deadly to my two-year-old and Jedediah's little boy than COVID. Nobody's talking about that. Oh, maybe because kids were kept away from other children and their immune, immune systems weren't able to be built up over the last year and a half. And uh, beyond that, the flu is more deadly to kids. You're more likely to be improperly buckling your child in a five-point car seat harness, but the schools and the churches and the health departments in Los Angeles County aren't checking every single parent with a kid under the age of eight years old. So the hypocrisy here and the lack of science and the leaning into the fear is what really concerns me. And I, and I have a concern. I've been saying this a lot. I feel like I'm repeating myself. A part of me is very glad that my eight-year-old, when a Sunday school teacher told her that she needed to put on a mask, was like, I'm sorry, you can't tell me what to put on my body. Talk to my mom. I was like, yes, queen. <laughs> but then the other part of me is concerned that these children have a distrust in people that they're supposed to have a level of respect for and authority. And I'm afraid it's, maybe this generation might go to the anarchal side and they want to blow everything up. And I'm okay with you know some of the systems being taken down as a small government conservative, but I'm concerned in 20, 30, 40 years. But that means not only for my daughters, but my granddaughters one day. So basically your daughter said, my body, my choice, which now makes her as an eight-year-old a right-wing maniac. Deborah, can you talk a little bit from a psychological perspective just about, about this fear issue that we're talking about? Not only that the kids won't be able to read adults and read other uh, children in terms of emotions, but the fear related to the parents, because I know a ton of people right now that are completely afraid to say what they think, whether it's vaccine related, government related, cancel culture related, that we're all walking around in this like very strange state of constant fear, or not all of us, mm -hmm. but, but many of us. Yeah, and to Alicia's point also with the, the science and the science denial that's happening, the suppression of science and the distortion of science, I find that really concerning as well as a broader theme because public trust in, in health messaging and the dissemination of this information it should not be political, but it has become political. And I, I totally understand why people are so skeptical now, because once you sense that there's a particular narrative and that people are lying to you about information that should be objective, well, I understand why people lose all trust and say, well, I'm not going to listen to anything that these organizations mm -hmm. or these experts are saying because they lied about this one thing. They're not admitting that they lied about it. And so what else are they potentially lying about? So with regard to your, your point about anxiety and fear. I mean, in terms of the mental health effects, I would say of the last 18 months to two years, I, I think it's devastating. I mean, for me, myself, I've been really lucky. I've been very healthy, but I, I look around at people I know and, uh, you know, you look at just overwhelmingly, people seem to really be struggling with depression, anxiety, in some cases, suicidal ideation, substance use problems. And these are adults. So you can only imagine what it's going to be like for children who are going through this, who may not have the vocabulary to express necessarily how they're feeling. But I would also say for with with regard to say cancel culture and the fact that people are actually losing their livelihoods over this and over the politicization of this actually makes me very angry because that should not be happening at all. I think whatever people choose to do with their own bodies is their business and whose business is it for them to come in and say you have to do this. You're they're essentially being people are being coerced, actually being coerced now because if you can't work, what what can you do? Yeah, Jedediah, are you shocked how quickly the adults all kind of failed? Like, that's what it seems like to me, that the, the adult class, the people that are basically between 35 and 60, just pretty much everybody just was like, yeah, we'll just do whatever you want. Just keep, you know, thank you, sir. May I have another? Yeah, I think it's concerning. It's deeply concerning that so many people are comfortable being told what to do, that they're comfortable telling other people what to do, and that they're also comfortable with the knowledge that there are some people that have a vested interest in this pandemic not ending. They have a financial interest in that. They have a political interest in that. And those fear tactics enable a lot of politicians to gain and maintain a lot of power. So really, this only changes when people say, I'm not doing it. When they say, I don't care if you fire me. When they say, I'll pull my kid out of school and I'll figure something else out. That's when this changes. And I think when it comes to the medical community, I have heard from hundreds, and I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of doctors who are appalled by what went down with respect to natural immunity. They have spent their whole lives basing their careers on actual science. When you come out and you're now saying that a bunch of kids who already are not in a high risk bracket 
by a long shot, now are going to be vaccinated. And you know that's going to come down to a mandate that's going to happen in schools. Let's just say it now. And those yep. kids are, yep. haven't even been tested for natural immunity to see if they don't need it. I mean, this is not about science. When you have people with medical exemptions in companies that signed letters from their doctors that are being ignored, this is not about health. So people need to wake up. And they need to wake up fast. You have people that have fled communist regimes showing up at rallies and saying, we are trying to warn you that when, mm -hmm. you know, the thing is, Dave, when you don't have your health, you, you, there's nothing else, right? If you're sitting and you're unhealthy, nothing else matters. And it's, it's shocking to me that people don't trust their own gut and are so comfortable living, listening to a bureaucrat, be it a political bureaucrat, a corporate bureaucrat, whatever it may be, make your voices heard. And if you're not willing to speak up for yourself, speak up for your children. And if you're not willing to speak up for your children, speak up for your country, for heaven's sake, because this is not what a free society looks like. Yeah, yep. you know, I, I had an illegal little dinner thing last night and a couple people here and it was a girl who I hadn't met before was brought by a friend and she was saying that she grew up in Soviet Russia. Her parents uh, are here now and all they've been talking about for the last year is how this is exactly what it felt like over there. Like Wait, we're dinners are illegal? I don't, was it illegal? I'm not even sure what I'm doing anymore. I never leave, so I don't know. <laughs> I was if just it was say, I've been having illegal dinner parties and barbecues and play dates. I know. Yes. All, all, you have to stay in your bunker permanently. Uh, yeah, I know. I uh, well, we'll talk about Florida later. Uh, Alicia, um, the media side of this, which Jen and I is sort of hitting, that we just don't we don't trust anybody anymore. Nope. And it seems to me like all you know, I don't have cable anymore. But when I do see clips out of CNN and MSNBC, it's like they should be playing the Looney Tunes theme in the back because it's just. <laughs> It's just utter nonsense, but this is not isn't, a bad idea, this, actually, Dave. <laughs> no, trust me, it works. And also, when Keith Olbermann is standing on his porch above Central Park when he's doing his rants, you play the Looney Tunes theme song to that. Oh, that's perfect. Um, but that that we don't trust our media anymore. Bit of a problem, right? Yep. It's a major problem, and they are completely. By the way, the distrust in media was happening. I was giving speeches in 2019 about distrust in media and how that's bad for American society as a whole because we should be able to tune in and watch someone whether it's you or Ben Shapiro or even Jake Tapper on CNN and think, this guy's gonna be delivering me the facts and the truth. Except unfortunately, and when it comes to a lot of mainstream, all of the mainstream media outlets, yeah. I would argue, that is not the case anymore. And so you have people, I think, that are then turning to the extreme conspiracy theories. Uh, like one thing that I saw this week, three different sent friends sent me from the OSHA website saying that they are not going to have employers report side effects to the COVID vaccine because they, OSHA is encouraging all employers and all employees to get the vaccine. And maybe they'll reassess that next year. When I saw this screenshot, I was like, this has to be fake. This has to be from some anti-vaxxer mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on Instagram. Nope, went to the website myself and it's there. But the media isn't going to report on it. And this is the type of truths, all it takes is a truth in a conspiracy theory to feed the conspiracy. And the mainstream media is 1000% complicit in this and they are increasing the divide in the United States. They like to think that it was Donald Trump. They like to think that it's us crazy conservatives, but in fact, it is them and they need to look in the mirror. Also, you're seeing the power of not just big media, but the, the collusion between big media, big tech, big Hollywood, big, now big pharma. I mean, I look sometimes and I see, I, I'm on you know, Twitter and I'm like, are these ads from pharmaceuticals? And, and, and they're news headlines coming from supposed news organizations. Yep. And it's just, you know, <laughs> this isn't about how you personally or I personally feel about vaccines. Mm -hmm. This is about, you know, they're trying to just push a certain way of life on people. We live in the United States of America. This is supposed to be, you know, the land of the free. Where is it? I mean, you now, people say, well, you have the option. You don't have to get the vaccine. Really? Well, I didn't know that that was supposed to come with a little note that said, if you decide that for yourself because you've had it or you have another health condition, or maybe you just don't want the vaccine and you want to incur that risk onto yourself, you also have to say, I'll never work again or I'll be out of a job and won't be able to feed my family. No, I'm sorry. That is not the workings of a free society. That is the way tyranny operates. And you see it alive and well in places like Los Angeles and New York City, where people now have to answer to Bill de Blasio, not their own doctors, not their own doctors, Bill de Blasio about what they should do with their health tomorrow if they want to eat a sandwich in a restaurant. This is atrocious what's going on and people need to wake up. Jedediah, ironically, I was in New York City a couple weeks ago and it's a hell of a lot better than LA. That may be hard for you to believe, but it, <laughs> is, it is way more open. There's way more people out. There are way more people not wearing masks. 
and everything else. Deborah, at a psychological uh, perspective, we were all taught when we were growing up, stand up to the bullies, say what you mm -hmm. think, be different. None of that exists anymore. That's a problem. <laughs> Well, I think even though we were taught to stand up to the bullies in terms of, say, social psychology and group behavior, people tend not to want to be ostracized by their peers or by society because from an evolutionary perspective, if you are get kicked out of the group, you're left to fend for, your own, for yourself. And we do see that with people who do get canceled. I think some of us keep going regardless, you know, as you and I talked about last week, just it doesn't matter how they're going to try and ostracize us or how they're going to try and punish us. We're going to keep going. But I don't think everyone is, is necessarily like that. And I think for a lot of people, the the potential risk of speaking up is really terrifying and they would they have an easier time just going about their lives. I think also if you have a family, you have a mortgage, I understand why there may be different pressures at play. But I, I would really advocate for anybody, you know, now is the time to do it because it's only going to get worse. And the fact, I don't even think that most people are on board with what's happening. I actually think mm -hmm. most people are really mm -hmm. skeptical. They're really uncomfortable, but they're afraid because there is that aspect of being shamed, being called a conspiracy theorist, being called a crazy person. People don't, don't want that. And it, they're making it especially hard for us to find each other because yeah. it is so seen as so socially unacceptable to have these views. But to definitely, I mean, I'm sure your audience already already knows this, but anyone watching, you're not alone in the way that you feel. And I can only imagine how isolating it must be to to think that, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, I, the, I agree the, with you so much there, Deborah. I think that this is where Jedediah's point about how big tech is working with big pharma and liberals in power to suppress the voices that are really representing average Americans that go to social media and they see their favorite celebrity or their favorite talking head or their favorite, you know, late night TV host telling them that they are crazy if they are anti-mandate or they are insane if they're anti-teacher and they don't want their kids masked at school. But they truly are not, they're not alone. And I would say to anyone that's watching that feels alone, we're not the only ones that agree with you. Obviously, we're all sticking our necks out there because, you know, it's a part of our job and I joke that I've dug my political grave, so I might as well lie in it. But there are a <laughs> lot of moms out there. There are a lot of dads. There's a lot of small business owners. There's a lot of people on boards of corporations that agree with you, and we need your voices to rise up or this ain't going to stop. Jedediah, yeah, you know, as someone that was on The View and, and, you know, arguing all sorts of perspectives all the time, and, you know, unfortunately, in my humble opinion, The View, the view ain't what it was, say, 20 years ago, uh, when when Barbara first started, when it really was something special, I think um, the fact that we can't seem to do any of this publicly, you know, we walk, you know, we'll have people walking off stage if an, if someone comes on with a viewpoint they don't like, or cutting to commercial or yelling at people. Even the very people who are supposed to enable some level of conversation don't seem to be doing it very well right now. Yeah, well, that's a reflection of a coddled society. That's a reflection of, you know, college campuses where you have safe spaces and you're triggered if someone dares to say something that you disagree with and you are told that it's OK to feel that way. Yes, you know, you're supposed to be in a protected space. No, that's not real life. And it's going to be incumbent upon parents to teach their children otherwise. It's going to be incumbent upon parents to say, you know what, you're going to enter rooms full of people that disagree with you, stand up for what you believe in, listen carefully. If your mind gets changed, admit to it, be an honest person in those exchanges and be passionate about what you believe. So a lot of it's gonna come down to family, it's gonna come down to community, and it's gonna come down to reversing. Unfortunately, you send your kids to college oftentimes, and I've taught in college classrooms as well, and that's where brains go to rot. I know that's controversial, but it's true. You enter that those spaces and suddenly you are inculcated with, this is the way you're supposed to see the world. And if you don't see it that way, there will be consequences grade-wise. You will be ostracized. You'll have to, you know, go and all of a sudden you're part of meetings, you know, that you're subjected to because you may have offended this person or that person. That's not what the college experience is supposed to be like. So parents need to be aware that they need to work overtime, unfortunately, right now, maybe fortunately, in their homes and in their communities to build backbones in their children. Because the yeah. fact that we can't sit and have a conversation without someone crawling into a corner and saying, I need a safe space is absolutely despicable. And by mm -hmm. the way, that's also the reason why 
You have a lot of people right now who are saying, I don't want to do this when it comes to a mandate, but they succumb because that American spirit has been beaten down year after year after year. Remember, it's your family, it's your body, it's your right to make those decisions. And even if there are consequences, trust me, when people band together, you see what happened with the pilots, they all band together and they said, you know what, this mandate doesn't work for me and guess what, change happened. So you have to you have to band together and you have to stand for something at the end of the day. And maybe it will cost you something. Listen, I have spoken my mind in places. I've lost jobs. I've lost opportunities. But guess what? I sleep really, really well at night. And I tell people all the time, stand for something and uh, you'll sleep well at night. So, yeah, that's my message. For the record, Joe Biden did say that uh, it was weather that somehow only affected Southwest flights. He said it had nothing to do with the all striking the pilots or anything. Deborah, you've also put your butt on the line for the things that you believe in. For people that haven't seen our full interview, um, can you just talk about what that's like just in your own professional career? Because you did it and it and it did affect the, the course of your career. Right. I mean, I probably received the most pushback for the things I say about gender, being critical about gender ideology, and especially, you know, uh, in terms of what's being taught in the education system, what's happening in academia with cancel culture and professors losing their jobs and scientists being shunned for doing legitimate research. So I, I left academia myself because I wasn't willing to stay quiet about the issue of gender transitioning in children and just that it's not backed from a scientific perspective. The best course is to let these kids wait till they get older and make the decision about whether they want to transition or not. Um, and, you know, The End of Gender, my book came out last year, and that was a whole other wave of mm -hmm. harassment and things that the activists chose to do. And um, But, you know, I feel the same way. It, at the end of the day, I am proud of who I am. I'm proud of my work, and I would not feel right having to say or do, do things and go along with things that I'm not actually in agreement with. And I think more largely with COVID, I see it as a blessing in disguise because it has shown us who people really are in some mm -hmm. ways, I think, in terms of the authoritarianism, the controlling aspect. Um, I think especially with, say, parents who are teaching their kids about this in terms of bodily autonomy and the importance of having your own choices and your own mind and not succumbing to peer pressure. And this is a really unfortunate way to have to learn this lesson, but I do think it's a, it's a good one to have. To that and point, I think it's really important to note that I, I do empathize with people who are making the decision of, do I keep my blue collar job at a factory where the corporation that might be based on one of the left coasts uh, is forcing me to get the vaccine? And like, when you have to provide for your family, that's a really tough cost benefit analysis. But I would even say to those people, I know you're not alone. I get DMs from your wives yep. and your sisters and your kids. And I think that you just, Ben uh, says this, Ben Shapiro, my brother from another mother, often says this, he's like, just find 20%. Go to the friendlies in your company over lunch break or smoke break or whatever and say, hey, do you agree with me on this? Because I guarantee that there are more of you and the more that of you that band together, like we saw with the Southwest pilots, is going to have a positive effect because the more of you there are, the more afraid their corporation will be of losing you. And they can't do that because then it affects their bottom line. I should take a screenshot of what my inbox looks like from the amount of people that are reaching out to me, whatever job they might have, literally from IT guys to janitors to executives that are all trying to fight in their own way. So you're right, if we can, if we can catch that 20% of people who might just need to be pushed a bit more. But my last question for you guys is, um, I, I do sense from everything we're talking about here that there is a mass red pilling happening. It's hard to see in a way, but in the last year and a half, like if you really think that the government cares about you that much, if you think that the elite class cares about you that much, like you're really sort of asleep. And I think a lot of people are questioning things that they didn't question, say two years ago. And that is good for the long-term health of the country, the society, and just us as individuals. Are you guys kind of on board that crazy positive train I'm gonna try to end this Friday show with? Jedediah, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think people's eyes are open because they just, they got pushed too far. I mean, I think the mandates were a big mistake, a huge mistake, because people just, you know, people aren't stupid by and large. They have a lot of common sense and they're saying, well, 
if this is a virus that even if you're vaccinated, you can catch and transmit, why is this being mandated? What is going on? And now they're alert to the fact that there are politicians in power and there are institutions in power and social media companies in power who really just more than anything want to be the thought police and, and the control police. And I think that that you know, the one silver lining, I think, through this all is that I think a lot of people eyes are open, uh, eyes are open. But uh, again, and I am empathetic, believe me, I, I totally agree with what Alicia said. There are people that are trying to put food on the table and they're saying, what do I do? They're between a rock and a hard place. They're up all night. Their mental health is struggling. I get it. But again, I will say, if your eyes are open, then feel compelled to do something about mm -hmm. it, to not only say something, but to reflect it in your own life, not just for you, but remember your kids learn from you. The reason, one, of the, one of the reasons I wrote that book, Dear Hartley, that you held up so beautifully, Dave, in the beginning, is because I wanted to remind parents that kids are watching. And if you want values like self-reliance and autonomy over your own body and your way of thinking and diversity of thought and all of these things that we've talked here about today, if you want them, to, to receive that and to know its importance and to know its power, you have to exemplify it. So I know it's hard sometimes, but sometimes when it's hard is when you need to do it most because someone else is relying on you and saying, well, if they're doing it, you know what, I'm hopping on board too. And that sense of camaraderie can change an entire nation and change an entire election and have drastic positive consequences and a ripple effect. So um, their eyes are open, but I think we need to see more action. It's almost like one person can change the world. Who would have thunk it? Deborah, do you see that hope? Do you think people have woke up and are thinking about things a little bit differently? I think a lot of people have woken up. I think there is still a minority of people who are going along with this who probably aren't going to be able to be woken up at this point. But I would say for the people who are awake and see what's happening, don't question your feelings about it, number one, because I think that's the worst when people feel like that. That's what really makes people go feel like they're losing their minds because they are being gaslit in terms of the narrative that's happening and how mandates are going back and forth and people are being told all kinds of things depending on what seems to suit a particular political agenda. So I would say however you feel is legitimate, don't question that. Don't feel that you have to go along with what's being presented more broadly. And I would also say going to the, back to the mental health aspect, if you can even find one other person, say at work or in your social circles, with whom you agree, or you don't even have to agree, but with whom you can have mm -hmm. honest conversations about how you feel. That's gonna do so much in terms of just helping you cope to get through this process. I mean, I feel very lucky. I have very supportive people in my life. I can't imagine what it's like for people who have to go to work or are surrounded by people in, in their social sphere when they, they can't actually say how they feel or that they're questioning any of this without fear that they're gonna be shunned or that people are gonna think that they've lost their minds. Alicia, as one of the people in my social circles in this crazy town, <laughs> bring us home. Give us some hope I, to I mean, go I out on the weekend say, with. I, I went to four different businesses yesterday and was only asked to put on a mask when a, one Karen complained to the sales clerk about me as I was making a return. I will not name the store. But most of the time when I walk around Los Angeles, especially when I have my three adorable girls, other people see me, they give me a thumbs up, they give me a little head nod, and they take off their mask. Little old ladies who are double masked take off their mask and start to talk to my girls and look at them in the eye. One woman even a couple weeks ago looked at me with tears in her eyes and was like, this is the first child's face I've seen in six months. Your girls are beautiful. Thank you for letting, mm -hmm. like, thank you for sharing them with the world. So one person can make a difference and don't underestimate that. Ladies, I thank you for fighting alongside of me. Have a great weekend. <laughs> and I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish up solo here. I'm gonna try to keep the good vibes going for just a moment or two, but thank you guys. Uh, Thanks, Dave. Dyer, we're gonna Thanks, link to Dave. your book down below. Well, we'll link to, awesome. Deborah. you've got a book too. We're gonna link to that. I've got Alicia, a book. Wait, do you have a book? Nah. What? You should have a book. You should have a book. <laughs> There's a parenting book in there somewhere. All right, you got to get okay. a book. I'll send you my agent. Okay, thank you guys. Have a great weekend. All right, everybody. I, I hope you enjoyed that. I, th I think I fared well with three females, according to uh, the Google definition of female. I don't want to get banned from uh, YouTube. Uh, by the way, we actually, believe it or not, as far as I know, you know, yesterday a lot of you were commenting, my God, he's going to be demonetized and deleted after all of the things that I said yesterday. As far as I know, we did not get demonetized, but I was informed this morning that apparently on a whole host of YouTube channels, uh, people are getting deleted, banned, demonetize the whole slew of words that they can do to you and things that they can do to you. If you say, let's go Brandon, 
So I just want to say that I'm not saying let's go, Brandon. I'm just curious if I'm allowed to say let's go, Brandon, and like what that would do if a guy like me was to say let's go, Brandon, on a show like this. Of course, I'm not outright saying it. I'm just questioning what the YouTube policy is on let's go, Brandon. Uh, you know, we can Google let's go, Brandon, and maybe we could Google, you know, find out more about this Brandon fella and what he's doing. Um, but, you know, of course, I'm not just sitting here like, let's go, Brandon. You know what I mean? Obviously, that's not something that I would say, let's go, Brandon. I'm just saying, am I allowed to say, let's go, Brandon? Because it's an interesting thing that somebody might say. You know what I mean? I have a friend, my friend from eighth grade, Brandon. It's like, great guy. Let's go, man, you know? Uh, so, uh, look, you know, a lot of the main shows that you guys watch are brought to you by Pfizer. And I just want to say, I'm Dave Rubin. This has been The Rubin Report, brought to you by Brandon.